um, as Mike said, I'll be talking about disturbances in estuarine communities today. And this is for um, my, re my research for my master's thesis. Uh, to begin, really what the first thing we have to do is we have to figure out, well, what is a disturbance? And to answer that, it's largely any sort of a phenomenon that causes a change in an ecosystem. And typically they're associated with uh, organism mortality, so deaths and various things. And it can also even change like the structure of an organism, especially with something like a hurricane. Some disturbances are natural, others are man-made, but one of the, oh, I've done something I shouldn't have. My apologies here. Oh, I fixed it, okay. <laughs> but these disturbances aren't always negative. There are certain ecosystems, such as here in Florida with the pine forests, that actually require big disturbances like fires in order to progress or to survive. In the case of some of these pine trees, some of them, their seeds don't even spread until the forest is burned. In other cases, like the longleaf pine, they do, the seedlings actually, or the saplings do not actually even reach a second stage of growth until they've started to burn. So disturbance isn't always a bad thing, but in many cases, it's a major event that can be broken down into two, there are, two, there are really two different kinds of categories of disturbance that I like to think of. We have chronic disturbances, like climate change and forest fires, where it's sort of all the, a whole bunch of disturbances that happen over time and with some regularity, maybe not necessarily on a particular um, period, but they do happen frequently. Climate change being things like colder winters, hotter, hotter summers, drier summers, whatever it may be, but these are all disturbances happening over and over again. And acute disturbances, more of a singular event, something such as red tide, which tends to be have a defined start and an end to it. Pollution events, such as this at the mouth of Tampa Bay here from 1993. Dredging events with the silting out of, of everything, or even the dredging itself. Or hurricanes, where there's a fine start and end. There's a whole bunch of other disturbances that are far beyond the scope of this talk. But, and there's some overlap, too, between these, and you can lump them back and forth. Um, but I'm primarily interested in looking at climate change as a chronic type of disturbance, and red tide as a more of an acute disturbance. So with that in mind, that led me to a couple of different questions. One, in regard to chronic disturbances, I was curious, have fish assemblages in North Florida estuaries become more similar to those in the south over time, especially with warming, warming winters or just changing temperature dynamics in general? And regarding acute disturbances, specifically red tide, I, was, it occur, I had a, kind of had an epiphany of a while back. I was wondering, do red tide events trigger or change the spatial distribution of estuarine fish assemblages? So digging into chronic disturbance matter first, especially with climate change. Some of this work has already kind of started. Joel Fadri was, uh, Dr. Joel Fadri actually came and gave a talk a couple of years ago, before I got here, unfortunately. Um, but they surveyed uh, up in the Florida Panhandle in 2006 and 7, following on data that already existed from the 1970s. And they noted that there was, even in that 30 year time frame, in just that relatively small area, a large increase or large changes in abundance in several different species of fish, one of which being this emerald parrotfish. And there were a handful of species that were not, not seen prior in the 1970s. Some, a couple of butterfly fish, there was a wrasse and some others. They sort of hinted that perhaps this is a tropicalization of the, of the northern Gulf of Mexico to some, because some of these species are more tropically associated and they had increased in, in abundance. So that brings me to the rest of Florida and more my side of things, where we're lucky to have, as John already mentioned in his previous talk, Florida Fish and Wildlife's Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. It is definitely a 20 plus year mon continuous monthly monitoring program. And in fact, in Tampa Bay, it started in 1989, so it's 30 years in Tampa Bay, which is pretty amazing. It covers all seven of these regions. And in, this er in these areas, they use three different types of gear, depending on what the depth is and whether we're targeting uh, young of the year juveniles or fully adult fish. But at the end of the day, all of all the fish that are caught and selected commercially important invertebrates, such as blue crab um, and a couple of different uh, shrimp species, they're all counted and analyzed and summarized and reported later. So using these summarized reports from the last 20 years, from roughly 1998 to 2018, I would like to take a look at the fish assemblages in Apalachicola Bay, Cedar Key, Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor, so all the four main West Coast estuaries that are covered by the FIM data, and look at the diversity indices and look for index species and try to determine has Apalachicola Bay or Cedar Key started to take on characteristics or species perhaps of Charlotte Harbor or Tampa Bay, or perhaps we may see other things moving as well. So, shifting gears a little bit from the larger picture of climate change, 
more on the red tide here. So again, I had asked, do red tide events change the spatial distribution of estuarine fish assemblages? So basically, my question is, do fish assemblages or their populations relocate or change in some manner during a red tide event? For this, I thought I would use Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor as example estuaries because they are both shaped very, very similarly. They both are drowned river estuaries. They both take riverine input from their northern ends. So they're, they're really they're quite analogous to one another in that sense. So if there's going to be some sort of spatial change, perhaps it would show up here. My focus would be on the 2005 red tide event because this red tide event had major effects for both estuaries. And it was similar to the 2018 one event that we just had, and it's still more or less ongoing right now. Uh, the beauty of this, well, I suppose not beauty, but the <laughs> beneficial part of using the 2005 event is that the FIM data covers the ten, at least 10 years prior, pretty much, and the 10 years after. So there are lots of neutral red tide months that can be compared against, or at least looked at. A bit then about red tide, and specifically Karenia brevis, is Florida Fish and Wildlife regularly monitors for Karenia brevis cells, which is the organism that causes red tide. And during red tide events, or during major blooms, they even increase their efforts. So there's lots and lots of data points, especially in the Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor areas during these red tide events, so we can see, well, where was red tide specifically in these bays? With that in mind, there's been research that demonstrates that Karenia brevis specifically has it's more likely to bloom at relatively high salinities. Not necessarily that it can't exist at low salinities, because it can, but just maximum growth rates aren't really realized until salinity comes up above 20, and depending on the strain, it could be even 24, sometimes 30. With that in mind, and the structure of these estuaries, the northern, the upper portions of the bays tend to be lower salinity, based on just that's where the freshwater input is and, and mixing. There's some hydrographic model support that, there, that especially this upper region of Tampa Bay really doesn't, have, doesn't maintain that high salinity sometimes. So the thing about this is that that environment, as far as fish are concerned, is normally habitable for redfish, uh, snook, pinfish, all of these sorts of species that we would see in the lower portions of the bay. Which led me to think, well, what if these are possible areas of refuge? <coughs> Perhaps, uh, if nothing else, maybe, they are, maybe they, the fish that happen to stay in here do not, are not as affected by the red tide. It's hard to say, but it was something that came to mind, and we may see similarly in Charlotte Harbor because the structure is, is similar, at least. There's a variety of future work that can come off of this as far as chronic disturbances go. Um, if, if we can certainly have a better understanding of just longer-term trends about these fish assemblages on the West Florida Shelf especially with regard to tropicalization, if we have something such as that parrotfish, which, which is a distinct seagrass herbivore, that may have larger effects later on, especially with seagrass beds. It's hard to say at this point, but that could certainly follow on from this. And with regard to acute disturbances, especially red tide, if it turns out that these upper portion, uh, or even maybe not necessarily the upper portion, but different portions of the bay are sort of, a, of different bays or refuges of some kind, Maybe it would allow us that if we have to choose, say, whether we focus conservation efforts on the lower part of the bay, which perhaps is more beautiful seemingly to some, that maybe we should try to also make a conceited effort to preserve the upper parts of the bay if they're a refuge. And certainly having a better understanding of just very localized, detailed effects of what's going on within a bay with respect to fish populations during a red tide event. So lots to come out of this. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for all their support and all their help in making this possible. Now I have to take questions. <laughs>